Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Himani Singh, working as an assistant professor in Institute of Business Management, GLA University, Mathura. Today in this session, I am going to talk about a very important topic that's non-verbal communication. By the end of this session, you all will be able to understand that what we mean by non-verbal communication and what is its significance as a manager, why you need to study and understand non-verbal communication. Also, I will be taking care of discussing the types of non-verbal communication. In addition to this, we will be analyzing the situation that what kind of non-verbal communication is good which non-verbal clues you should avoid and so on. So now let's begin with the session 4 on non-verbal communication. Very appropriately quoted by Peter F. Drucker. The most important thing in communication is hearing what isn't said. I repeat again, the most important thing in communication is hearing what isn't said? Yes, that talks about the essence of non-verbal communication. In the previous session, I focused upon the verbal communication or the verbal part of the communication, which we talk about or which is more related to what needs to be spoken or what needs to be written. Or rather I should say what should be your content but here in this session I am going to talk about that how you should put your points across that's why people are more interested in hearing what isn't said we try to look behind the bars we try to look behind that what's the meaning is all about many a times we don't go with the literal meaning of a term but we Focus upon the tone with which it is said, the posture with it is communicated and so on. So now let's begin to understand that what we mean by non-verbal communication. All those ways we use in order to communicate apart from language is under non-verbal communication. That means when we try to convey our ideas, thoughts, feelings, emotions, etc. by the help of gestures, facial expressions, body language, physical appearance and so on. So this is what is non-verbal communication. When we communicate the things around us by our facial expressions, eye contact, gestures and so on. Communication other than written or spoken language that creates meaning for someone is known as non-verbal communication as very appropriately quoted by Ivy and Well. In fact, it is a proven fact that about 55% of the interpersonal messages are conveyed through non-verbal way. 55%. Again, that's a big number, which is being communicated through non-verbal clues. What we are saying, that does not matter. That does not matter to the other person. But what matters the most is, how are we putting it across? With which tone, volume, pitch, and so on, we are putting it across. So now, let's move forward and understand that what's the purpose of non-verbal communication? 
Thus, it was Argyll who suggested that yes, nonverbal communication tends to serve different purposes. And one purpose in this direction is that it helps in expressing the emotions of a person. See, when we talk about that, are you happy? So, you always have a smile on your face, right? The moment you are sad, it is there on your face. It's there in your body posture. You tend to shrug like this. You tend to sit like this with a lower head posture. You are not happy. So, what's that? Many a times we are not saying it through our words. I might ask you, are you not happy? But you are not saying, you are saying no, absolutely fine. But facial expressions is saying something else. Your eye contact, I am not looking into your eyes and saying this. I am just looking here and there and saying, yes, I am perfectly fine. What does this mean? That means I am hiding somewhere or something from you. That means somewhere or the other, my emotions are more easily being observed through my nonverbal clues. Also, the other purpose which Argyll talked about is to convey interpersonal attitudes. Yes, nonverbal communication helps in conveying the interpersonal attitudes. What we mean by an attitude? An attitude is a feeling. It can be a negative feeling or a positive feeling about someone, about anything around you, right? That is what is an attitude. And when I am saying that it helps in conveying the interpersonal attitude. Yes, it is very, very clear through your body language that whether you like the other person or you dislike the other person, whether you are happy what the other person is saying or you are unhappy. So that is how nonverbal communication also serves the purpose of communicating the interpersonal attitudes among the sender and the receiver. Apart from this, yes, nonverbal communication helps you in presenting your personality as well as temperament. Now, you might have seen that the leaders, they used to have a very strong personality. And how you are able to judge that they are having very strong personality? by their body language, their body posture, their eye contact, their facial expressions because all such things tends to make up their self-confidence and that's how you are able to analyze that yes, this is a great leader, he is having a positive body language. The moment you see a person standing like this, you might find him that he is having a closed body posture which is actually not correct when you are having a discussion with the other person. So yes, to present one's personality, temperament, yes, non-verbal communication helps in doing that also. Apart from that, one more function which Argyll talked about or you can say one more purpose which Argyll suggested is that non-verbal communication accompanies verbal communication. Now, when I am going to talk about a company in verbal communication, I will be think, talking about these three parameters. Either non-verbal communication is going to complement verbal communication or it is going to substitute or it can be in the conflicting manner. I will explain you how. First, I will be talking about complementing. For example, if you are asking me that am I able to understand this concept, fine, you are asking me a question that am I able to understand this concept and I am saying yes ma'am. So what does this mean? What I am doing? I am using non-verbal clue to complement my verbal communication, nodding my head like this is non-verbal and saying it through the mouth that yes ma'am that is my verbal communication. So what I am trying to do, I am trying to or I am taking help of non-verbal gesture or non-verbal communication to complement my verbal communication. Undoubtedly it is one of the best one 
wherein both verbal as well as non-verbal communication are in congruence. They are synchronized that tends to impact your communication a lot because when both the things that's verbal and non-verbal they are moving in the same direction that talks about that it is true communication. Second is substituting. Non-verbal communication also shares a substitution relationship with verbal communication. Again the same question I'm asking or you are asking me that am I able to understand this concept and what I'm doing is I'm not saying it from my mouth I'm only nodding my head what do you mean by this that what I have done I have just substituted my verbal communication with the non-verbal communication that is I have replaced saying it yes verbally or orally rather than I am just nodding my head in the right direction. So that is what is that non-verbal communication shares a substitution relationship with verbal communication. In most of the situations we do this. The boss asking the manager that are you able to understand will you be accomplishing the target so the person is simply nodding the head what does this mean that is he or she is substituting or using non-verbal communication as a substitute to verbal communication fine now the third is more interesting it's about conflicting relationship non-verbal communication also shares a conflicting relationship with verbal communication Again the same situation, you are asking me a question, am I able to understand and see what I am doing? Yes. What is this? You ask me a question, am I able to understand? I am saying yes ma'am. So this is I am into the conflicting relationship. My non-verbal communication is in conflict to the verbal communication. So this is how you can analyze the other person that how things are moving around that whether you are sharing uh, your non-verbal gestures are sharing a um, substituting rela relationship or a complementing relationship or a conflicting relationship that you need to look for. So that was Argyll who talked about the different purposes which are being sorted by non-verbal communication. Now moving further I will be talking about the types of non-verbal communication. Non-verbal communication is categorized into six categories that is kinesics which is also known as body language, proxemics also known as space language. Haptics, touch, sensation, chronemics, time language, chromatics, color language and para language also known as light language. Also you can say that non-verbal communication is known as silent language. So I am going to talk about six different categories of non-verbal communication that is silent language, one is kinesics which is also known as body language, then moving further I will be discussing about proxemics which is about space language, then touch or haptics, time language, chronomics, light language, para language and chromatics, color language. Moving forward, I will be starting with the kinesics, which is also known as body language or we do say that it is the study of human movement, gesture and postures, commonly known as body language, right? So it provides valuable information about an individual, how you take up your postures, how you behave, how you interact. So 
a body of a person tends to speak a lot. He might be speaking something else, but the way his body is reacting to the environmental clues that tends to speak a lot. Again, I'll repeat this, action speaks louder than words. So that is what is about body language or kinesics. Moving further, I am going to highlight the different dimensions of kinesics. What are the different dimensions of kinesics? The very first dimension of kinesics is emblems. What does this mean? This mean keep quiet. What does this mean? Yes, you are correct. It's again saying keep quiet or I am not going to say or reveal this truth to anyone. So what do you mean by emblems? Emblems are some specific but widely understood meanings in a given culture that can actually substitute the words. So what I did when I did this, that means I am asking you to keep quiet and I am not saying it from my mouth. So what actually I have done? I have replaced the words and whatever emblems we are using, you will be finding that they are commonly used. The understanding for the emblems is commonly developed across the cultures, right? So again, these are the emblems which tends to communicate or wherein we tends to sub substitute the words in place, we use certain actions. Moving further, illustrators. What we mean by illustrators? This is the another dimension of kinesics. Illustrators are the gestures which tends to complement, substitute or enhance my communication with the other person. Illustrator, if someone is asking me which way to go, so rather than saying anything, I am just pointing my finger towards that direction. What does this mean? This is an illustrator. I just want to substitute my words with a finger that yes, you need to move into that direction. If someone is asking me that how much big that packet is and I'm showing like this. So what do you mean by this? That I am trying to illustrate through the actions that yes, it is a large one, right? So that is what is illustrators are, wherein we tend to use our gestures in order to complement, enhance or substitute the verbal message or whatever we want to communicate orally, right? Moving further is the third dimension of nonverbal communication. And that third dimension is about affect displays. What is affect displays? Affect displays are the facial expressions as well as the gestures which tends to display emotion. I hope you are able to understand the difference between the illustrator and affect displays. Illustrator, we were using gestures to indicate something. Whereas when I talk about affect displays, we are using facial expressions as well as our gestures to display my emotion, to express my emotion, my feelings. Now from as we are saying affect, that affect word is linked with the heart, that is linked with the emotions, linked with feelings. So when I want to express my feelings, my emotions, I can express it through my facial expressions as well as through my gestures. So see, just out of your facial expressions, you tend to communicate a lot. No one is telling me that this person is quarreling, this person is sad, this person is happy. Nowhere it's written like. But just out of looking at the facial expression, I can interpret that this person is having this emotion at present. As I said, that facial expressions tends to display your emotions. Apart from facial expressions, it is the gestures. 
when you get some good news what do you tend to do you tend to just raise your fingers high and you tend to say hooray what's that when you are raising your fingers higher up in the sky that is again a gesture which shows your emotion that you are extremely happy you are extremely cheerful at that moment so that is how your emotion is being expressed through your gestures right so that is what as affect displays which tends to somewhere or the other facial expressions and gestures displays your emotions your feelings your affect which is connected with the heart moving further into the another dimension of kinesics that's regulators regulators as the name is suggesting itself something that you are somewhere or the other regulating something so yes these are the gestures which used which are used to control the turn taking in some conversation for example if there is some discussion going on and you want to ask a question so what you will be doing you might be simply raising your hand and what it shows that yes you want to ask something certain times when you uh, want to start a conversation you start clearing your th throat that is also a kind of regulator when you start your speech you tend to do some kind of non fluencies that is also a kind of regulator wherein you tend to regulate the things in a restaurant when you want to call some waiter you might be doing like this so that finger which is being raised it is conveying that yes you want something new to happen into this conversation that means you want that some server to come and attend on your table so that is what is a regulator which is used or somewhere you can say that they are the gestures used to control the turn taking you want to somewhat put a pause onto that conversation and you want to go for another thing that is why we are calling it as turn taking in the conversation moving forward is adapters adapters are the gestures we use to release tension you might have seen some people when they are nervous they tend to play with their ring they tend to do their hands like this they tend to play with the fingers what's that they are the adapters what you are using what you are doing you are trying to release your tension you tend to take deep breaths somewhere at that moment so these are the gestures which you used to release your stress your tension so these are the five different dimensions by which you can analyze the body language you can analyze that what kind of emotion a person is going through what kind of information or what kind of immediacy of action he wants to be taken so these are the five dimensions moving forward i will be talking about the elements of kinesics now the very first and the most basic element of body language that is kinesics is facial expressions now it can be in the form of neutralization masking or intensification now neutralization is that on your face there are no more expressions you are expressionless you might have seen some people that when they are happy their expressions are same when they are sad their expressions are same so they we call the, such kind of people or such kind of facial expressions as neutralized facial expressions wherein they are not able to express many things from their face next in line it can be masking yes many people are good at it masking is that you are having some other emotion inside your heart but you are repressing those emotions and you are showing something else on your face for example you might be feeling nervous and you are highly nervous 
but your head position is upright and you are having a small smile on your face and your eyebrows relaxed that might convey that you are looking confident person but within your heart you only know that you are the most nervous person at that particular point of time. So this is what is masking. Third is intensification. Intensification as the term itself suggests intensification you are trying to intensify the verbal communication with your facial expressions. I am happy. I am saying it through my facial expressions also through my verbal communication also. So that is what is intensification. So yes, you will be finding people around you who are in the neutralization form. There are people who can mask their emotions, can mask their feelings. And at the same time, you might be coming across people who are having intensified facial expressions. We do call certain times, we do call them as over expressive through their facial expressions, although that's the intensification concept. Now moving forward is about your head movement. Very important, very, very important. How you place your head position. You might have seen a person who tends to lie, his head position is like this. He is not going to put or take his head at this 90 degree angle. Or either that person is sad, then also his head movement is going to be like this. Some people who are overconfident, their head position is a bit upside. And they'll. this is being conveyed that they are overconfident people. Confident people, head position is at 90 degree of the angle. And yes, it conveys that you are confident. You are sure about yourself. You know what your competencies are and how you need to put across. That is what is the significance of head position or head movement, we can say. For example, if you are sitting in a meeting and you are just doing your head like this, what it is going to convey. Yes, you might be having some neck pain or something like that, but to the other person around you who is putting across some point, he might take you as that you are not interested in the conversation. So this is what is also the head movement, that how you are moving your head in the meeting, in the discussions. This is again a very important aspect you need to understand as from the point of view of a manager. Next is about your body posture, how you sit like. Have you ever seen the army people, how they are? They are always having a straight body posture. And that's what is being conveyed that they are the most confident people. They are the most patriotic people, right? Again, when we talk about body posture, body posture tends to signifies a lot. Shrugged shoulders tends to say that you are not confident, whereas upright shoulders tends to convey that you are confident person, you are putting your points across. So body posture, if you are sitting like this with the shrugged shoulders, it might convey that either you are not interested or you are feeling sleepy or somewhere you don't want to focus on what the other person is saying or you don't like the other person and so and so. So you really need to have a good body posture when you are sitting. Have you ever noticed the managers, the top notch leaders, how they sit? What is their body posture? Their back is always straight and they sit straight. Why? Because they treat or it is being treated that a straight body posture conveys that you are confident about yourself. You know yourself. So you need to have a good body posture. That's why it is being told to everyone that why it is necessary to have a good body posture because it conveys a lot about you. Not only body posture, it is also the gestures, the hand movement, how you move. For example, if you are giving a presentation, and you are moving your hands very often like this. So it shows that the other person is not confident. 
he is a bit nervous and out of this nervousness this happens you start playing with the finger with the ring with the pen with the paper in the hand so these are different gestures you tend to tap your feet you tend to tap the table so all such are the gestures which tends to convey that either you are not interested or you are not confident and so on good gestures tends to convey that yes you are interested you are confident you are competent so if you want yourself to be known as a competent and a confident person you really need to understand the basic clues of nonverbal communication particularly your body language now apart from this an individual's body shape also tends to communicate a lot yes this is somewhere linked with the personality and it was a theory which was being given by sheldon who says that somewhere or the other your body shape tends to tell that what kind of a personality you are going to be and this is how it is linked with the communication also that people who are short fatty kind of people they are the people who tends to communicate a lot they will be having too many friends they'll try to make everyone happy with their conversations so they are happy go lucky kind of people and it is being reflected when they communicate when they attach with the other people there are personalities in the terms of body shape who are thin personalities tall thin kind of people they are going to be the people who will be living in their own world who don't want to be connected with the people you will be finding that such people they are not good at making friends or making networks or getting into conversations they don't like it they just want to be in their own world they are happy doing their own work so see again these are some indications which can help you out in matching an individual's personality with his job so not getting into that particular depth but yes just to focus on this aspect that body shape also tends to tell that how and what you want to communicate to the other people apart from this oculistics oculistics is eye movement eye behavior right that is what is oculistics and that becomes the that is also a part of body language how you are making the eye contact with the other person are you looking into the other person's eyes or you are not looking you are trying to hide away majorly a common example which is being used that people who tends to lie they never look into the eyes of the other people right so this is again an indication that either you are lying or you are dishonest because you are not looking into the eyes of the other person so that is what is oculistics which is known as the eye behavior or the study of eye ball movement that is what oculistics is last but not the least one in the body uh language that is kinesics is physical appearance yes your physical appearance tends to leave an impact on the people around you see learners when we talk about managers we believe that a manager needs to be smart we don't focus on that a manager needs to be beautiful or needs to look handsome no not at all we are here focusing on that a manager needs to look smart and he should know that if he is going to his professional workplace what kind of attire he should wear are you thinking that a person who is coming to the office interview who is coming for a job interview he is coming he is wearing bathroom slippers he is wearing a baggy pajama or a t-shirt kind of thing no not at all you are idealizing that person that he is going to be in a professional business suit why why not a baggy t-shirt or bathroom slippers or something like that why not because that is somewhere communicating us a an informal attitude a casual approach whereas when we are going for a job interview we cannot have that casual approach we need to look formal because we are presenting ourselves so yes physical appearance is also very very important when we talk about body language or kinesics so these are all the elements of 
kinesics or body language. Now, moving towards another category of non-verbal communication that is proxemics, which is also known as space language. Yes, it refers to the impact of space on communication. I am repeating again, it refers to the impact of space on communication. How people create and use space around them and distance and how they behave to protect and defend their own space talks about proxemics or in simple terms I can say that how an individual uses space around him tends to communicate a lot. During your childhood time you might remembering one incident that when you are sitting with your best friend, right? I'm saying when you're sitting with your best friend, you are sitting nearby. But the moment you had a fight with your best friend, you tend to create a gap. Now, why are you creating a gap between you and your friend? Because you want some space now and you want to make it very clear, very distinct. See, I don't like you. Now you are no more my friend. So this is what a space language that how we utilize space around us that is space language. Now I just want to focus upon uh, a nomenclature which was being given by Edward T. Hall who identified four different zones of space in middle class US culture and yes you will be finding more or less this particular classification similar to all the cultures. He talked about four different spaces. The very first one is intimate space. Second one is personal space. The third one is about social space and the last one is public space. I am just marking the tentative demarcation social space is 4 feet to 12 feet and public space is 12 feet to your vision. Fine, I will explain you that what this these demarcations mean. The very first space he said that a person tends to share with the other person is intimate space. Now when we say intimate space, majorly the demarcation is very close to, to up to 12 inches, right? And intimate space is the space which a person tends to share with his closed family members, with his very near and dear ones, with his very close friends. So that is what is the intimate space which was being said about that yes a person tends to share the intimate space with his very near dear ones and yes if anyone is going anyone means apart from near and dear ones if anyone is going to come into this intimate space you will never allow that person to do that right moving forward he talked about the personal space now personal space an individual shares with his good friends, with his normal friends. Normal in terms of, I'm not talking about that, uh, see, we do have a concept like we, some people are very close to our heart, some people they are not that much close to our heart, but yes, they are our friends. Uh, we used to have a good gelling with them as well. So that is what is personal space we share. When I say personal space, so somewhere or the other, yes, 
I have a good relationship, good reputation with that person, but I'm not going to allow that person to enter my intimate space, right? Now, the third category is about social space. Now, social space normally we share with the people at our workplace. Again, at workplace, you can share personal space with some of the people. I'm not saying. But yes, social spaces, for example, uh, you are going to your uh, professor and you just want to ask him that what are your grades in the uh, recent examination, right? So what you are sharing the space with that person, with your professor is the social space. Normally at the professional front, we tend to share the space with the people around us that we call as social space. The last category is public space. Now in the public space, I am going to say that normally when uh, you will be taking an example like uh, uh, an, a politician addressing a rally, right? He is addressing the people around him and up to his vision, whosoever is visible to him that shares the public space. Now when I say public space, it's not important that you are going to be uh, known to that person that you know that person who that person is. No, not at all. It is just that you are there to address people and in that gathering, in that address, there are n number of people sitting and up to your vision to whom you can see that forms the part of public space, right? So proxemix is space language and remember one thing that you never allow anyone to enter your space and it is more about the study of usage of space, how you use the space around you, how you mark your territories, that is what is space language is about. Now moving further to the another category of non-verbal communication that is haptics. Now haptics is, it is the study of touch sensation, how you touch the other person that talks about haptics. It is very, very, very important, most impactful as well as most powerful, although it can be mostly misunderstood as well. All these three things are together. It's impactful, it's powerful, and at the same time, it can be misunderstood. So as a manager, you really need to be very cautious when you are at your professional front that how to touch the other person so that you should not be mis interpreted by the people around you. So that is what is a touch study, haptics. Now I am going to talk about a classification which was being given by Heslin. He said that there are different types of touch behavior. The very first touch behavior what we talked about is functional or professional touch. For example, if you are giving a firm handshake to a business client, that talks about functional or professional touch, wherein your handshake is going to be a very firm one, but it is only going to last for one, two, three seconds, not more than that. So that is what is functional or professional touch, wherein you will be using that touch at your workplace, right? Next in line is social or polite touch. Now, when I say social or polite touch, that is as per our cultural norms. For example, if someone does something good, you just tend to give a pat on his back. What's that? For example, if you as a subordinate, you did something good, you achieved the targets and your senior is giving a pat on your back, that is a real example of social polite touch, right? As per our culture, as per our cultural norms, beliefs, a person who does good, we used to give a pat on his back. So that is nowhere linked with the personal touch or something like that. It is only a social polite touch wherein you are expressing your emotion in terms of that the person has done something good, bad or whatsoever. Third category is friendship or warmth touch. Yes, it is also known as Platonic affection, platonic. Now, when I say friendship or warm touch, it is a bond which we share or this touch, we are going to uh, share this behavior with our friends, people who are 
good friends with us we might be giving a small hug we might be shaking the hand but that shake is going to be very different as i said that in the functional one the uh, handshake is going to last for one two three seconds not more than that but in the friendship of warmth touch that handshake is going to be ending for eight to nine seconds right and you might be holding the hand of the person by both the hands so that is what is about friendship or warmth touch that with handshake you are giving a small hug also to the person that is what is friendship and warmth touch next in line is love or intimacy touch which is more about your intimate touch which is more close when we talked about the space language also so we can say that in this particular touch the space is very less between the sender and the receiver not just this in fact when we talk about the sexual arousal it is more about the most intimate touch so see these are the different touch behavior and by this by this touch sensation you can analyze that what are the intentions of the other person or what message that person wants to communicate to you so this is the study of haptics that is touch sensation moving forward i am going to highlight chronomics what we mean by chronomics now chronomics is the role of time in communication the usage of time can actually impact your lifestyle your daily agendas your speed of speech your movement your attitude and all in fact i'm going to give you a very uh, beautiful example that uh, time can be used to indicate an individual status i'll tell you how in a meeting normally we have seen that a junior can not interrupt but a senior can interrupt whenever he wishes to so just by this you will be able to see that yes every time a senior is interrupting in between in between so that conveys that this person who is interrupting in between is the senior in the hierarchical order the person who are not able to interrupt in between they are not the part of the top management so yes how you utilize time that also tends to tell more about your status more about your personality in fact i am going to highlight these two types of culture that's monochronic time culture as well as polychronic time culture when i say monochronic time culture before starting this i want to give an example you are in a bank you are standing out of the cashier window and you are there to go on for transacting money and all you are waiting for your number that the cashier should complete the slip complete the entries and do all the necessary things you are waiting you are eagerly waiting but what you noticed that the other person who is sitting on the cashier's chair he is counting the notes he is writing something on another register he is on a call also he is looking out of the window also and it is making you highly annoyed because you are standing out of the window you are not taking up any calls which you are receiving you are just focusing on getting that money from that window but the person sitting on the other side of the table that person is doing different tasks at a time he is looking for your query also he is looking for another customer's query in some register he is looking out of the window to some other customer and a number of things he is doing simultaneously so in this situation you the person who is standing outside the window is or belongs to monochronic time culture and the person sitting on the cashier seat belongs to polychronic time culture i'll tell you how monochronic time culture people tends to do one thing at a time what you are doing you are eagerly waiting to get money from that window you are not taking up any calls you are not talking to any 
uh, side way customer or any other person you are simply focused on getting that money out of that window but the person sitting on the other side of the window what he is doing he is doing simultaneously in number of tasks so this is the very first point wherein we say monochronic time culture people do one thing at a time they do many things at a time monochronic people they tend to concentrate on their task and they never disturb others contrary to this interruptions aren't really interruptions they can still carry on with what they are doing now or later they don't see inter interruptions if the person sitting on the cashier seat if some peon is coming to get something signed he is uh, taking up a call also he is okay he is not taking it as interruptions whereas monochronic time people they are the personalities who tends to focus on one work at a time and they are going to concentrate on their task they are not going to disturb others for monochronic people time is linear they take deadlines and time schedules very very seriously but if i talk about polychronic people they are flexible yes time is special deadlines and time schedules can be rescheduled again right uh, also in monochronic time culture people people who belong to this time culture their communication is low context when i say low context that means they don't value on relationship whereas contrary to this polychronic time culture people they are of high context culture wherein they value relationships a lot in fact whenever they need to provide some information they will be providing large information polychronic time culture right they need explicit information that is the function that is the feature of monochronic time people and polychronic time people they don't usually need explicit information because they know that whatever is there it is sufficient it's large enough right when we talk about monochronic they are task oriented contrary to this polychronic are relationship oriented yes i will be catering to the other person's need to the different people need around me i'm not only focused on my work i am also trying to help other people around me so that is what i value relationship more in comparison to my task that's the difference yes monochronic people they do their work more swiftly more promptly because they are into one task only whereas polychronic people they are not able to do that last point is more about monochronic people make their plans and they stick with their plans whereas polychronic people they are highly flexible they may they'll make plan, make a plan but if it won't work out they'll try to change a little bit fine right? so this is how flexibility is more into the polychronic time culture people whereas if there is no flexibility they belong to the monochronic time people moving forward i will be talking about chromatics chromatics is communication through the use of color which color or rather i should say color tends to define our personalities a lot a lot people wearing vibrant colors we take them as vibrant personalities dynamic personalities people who go for pastel shades we believe that they are quiet personalities again it is a general assumption right but yes colors of clothing the products packaging gifts whatever you do with the colors it tends to signifies your personality it tends to signify what you want to communicate i'll tell you how see when we talk about the colors black is the color which is being used or wore during the morning in the us but white is worn to funerals by the japanese so if you are going for a funeral with your some japanese person right so you should wear white color you should never wear black color like this in us white is typically worn by brides but talk about indian society hindu society particularly they wear bright shades like red orange pink maroon and so on they are never going to wear a white color dress in their wedding so this is how color is being interpreted here in india we interpret color that is white color with mourning with sad something not good whereas bright colors we tend to associate bright colors with happiness prosperity around us also 
when we talk about purple purple is sometimes associated with royalty right but it is the color of death in mexico and brazil so whenever you are going and doing business with mexicans and brazilians you need to be very careful by the usage of this color because they tends to interpret another things by this particular color also red especially the red roses is associated with romance in some cultures including the us but in certain cultures it's nothing it's okay it's just a red flower that's it so this is how color language works for us at a traffic signal the moment we see red we tend to stop why why because color is telling us color is signifying us that red means stop yellow means that you can start green means you should go so this is what the colors are telling us so this was about the chromatics the last aspect of this particular non verbal communication classification is para language para language is also known as vocalics or like language it refers to how people use their voice how they present their ideas reveals our emotions our thoughts our relationships with the other people the vocalics which we are going to use it tends to express our emotions also when we talk about para language which is known as like language it tends to tell us it tends to tell about us that how much confident we are if i talk about the basic elements of para language so para language includes the tone the quality of a voice the pitch of the voice the volume the articulation of words the rate of speech the non fluencies and so on so somewhere when we talk about para language para language is more about it is speaking speed when we are sad our volume is less our pitch is less when we are happy the pitch might be high the tone might be good positive tone so how you say it how you say it that is more about para language the content can be same for all the people in the room but the way they are going to present that content that is going to make the difference in the presentation of all those people that is what is the beauty of para language so dear learners towards the end i am just going to tell you that how and what are the strategies you should use to improve on to your non verbal communication and you can become more sensitive towards non verbal clues yes you should always pay attention to the non verbal signals what you are getting from other business people that is going to help you on your negotiation table persuasion table convincing and so on look for the incongruent behavior as i told you that non verbal communication many a times shares a conflicting relationship so look for that incongruency so that you can make yourself aware that whether this is right communication or wrong communication focus on the tone of voice use good eye contact the more good eye contact you are going to use you will be holding your audiences more ask questions if you are not able to understand if you are getting a negative vibe or a, a different incongruency in the body language ask questions do ask the person that what they mean what is the meaning of that non verbal clue go and ask them so that you can become more sensitive towards the needs of the other person also consider the context in what context the things are being said don't go on for the literal meaning look for the situation also look for the context also not just this you can work upon your body language you can always learn positive body language to create good impression around the people around the room right so learn good and positive body language which is going to make you more confident more competent more expressive last but not the least be considerate of the personal space of the people around you do not enter the personal space of the people because if you are going to enter you might be interpreted in the wrong manner might be you are doing it accidentally but that's not a good thing to do so these are some of the strategies which you can use to make your non verbal communication an effective one so dear learners 
I think you are able to understand that what we mean by nonverbal communication, what are its types, how it works, what is the effective and ineffective nonverbal communication signals. Hope you are going to understand and you are going to avoid the nonverbal communication signals and you are not going to give those signals to the people around you. Because if you want to be effective communicator, you need to learn good body language, you need to look for space language and all. So, thank you and happy learning.